from the boundaries of the universe to the depth of your soul. Embark on a journey through the unknown and unexplained as we explore mysteries, magic, and miracles. To tap into spirits from another dimension, psychics, I have a good friend who's a psychic, can act as conductors to channel information. Each of us has the ability to reach a higher power, but we don't even realize it. From ancient times until today, many kinds of people have channeled, but they are known by different names. Medium, healer, witch doctor, fortune teller, guru, and prophet. In the San Francisco Bay Area, Professor John Klimo co-directs the doctoral parapsychology program at Rose Bridge Graduate School, one of only four universities in the world dedicated to the study of anomalous phenomena. He is also co-founder of OPUS, the Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support that helps people who have unusual personal experiences. He is considered an expert in channeling. What is channeling? I define channeling as receiving energy or information or guidance from some source other than oneself and originating from some level of reality other than the physical as we currently understand it. I, I guess my roots, uh, not only uh, uh, with regard to channeling, but to most paranormal or inexplicable fields in general, all of which I, I'm fascinated by and see as interconnected, began uh, for me as an artist and a poet. Way back in my teenage years, or even earlier, when I was doing paintings and creative writing and poetry, I would feel myself moving into these altered states of consciousness. I'd feel myself getting more and more inspired. And the more inspired I got, the more I, I, I felt, I wondered, where is this coming from? This isn't just me anymore. When I would kind of get in the saddle of the inspired moment, I was connected to other wavelengths, other worlds. Alan Vaughn is a psychic researcher or professional intuitive. He uses his talents in psychic archaeology to discover ancient ruins and in research experiments on psychic phenomena. But he also has the ability to channel an entity from another time. I went to a number of mediums uh, to see what they could say about me. Three of them said that I would be doing channeling myself one day and gave me the name of this Chinese entity, Li Sung. Well, my response was over my dead body. I felt this incredible energy come over me. And it was Lee Sung. There's what I would call full trance or unconscious channeling, where the channel goes away or goes unconscious and then comes back after the experience has occurred and doesn't have recall. I channel in a trance. It's like listening to a distant radio, as uh, Jane Roberts once said. I experience it very similarly. Uh, but Lee Sung shows me pictures of everything uh, he's talking about. And then he uh, impresses me. He's like standing behind me and he impresses me so that it all comes out in English. What I call in my book open channeling, it's the kind of thing that I do. I don't lose consciousness, I don't stop being myself, and as far as I'm aware, there is not a particular identifiable entity that's, that's talking to me, that's working through me. Uh, so far as I know, it's still me, but it's more than me. Uh, uh, good uh, day, my uh, uh, friends. Oh, we are most pleased to be in your lights. I do feel I connect to the universal. Well, we lived um, about uh, 1,200 years ago by your time in a small village in northern China. The more I get carried away, the more I open up into this, the more I feel like I am an individuation of God in human form, letting more and more of that awakenedness and realization pour through me. And as it pours through me, the language picks up faster and faster. I'm grabbing at, at, at hunks of sentences and metaphors and images popping to me. I, I'm sort of like clairvoyantly seeing all these images. Uh, we uh, counseled uh, persons who had, well, both physical and emotional problems. Uh, and we prescribed uh, herbs. And we did some therapy with them. But that there's something larger, a presence, pushing to come through this person. And that, that presence is not just that person. To help the people understand their past lives, their soul's purpose, how they may enrich their living with spiritual principles. 
in everyday life. We individual human beings have been kept down so long by government, by authorities, by churches, by science, and told, you're only this, you're only this, you're only this. The bottom line of all channeling for me is no, no, we are, we are capable of channeling, of accessing the universal. There can be danger in whom you connect to in the channeling process, and there can be danger in your own psychological strengths. Many people have the will to believe. I have the will to believe. Skeptics have the will to disbelieve. And in, and in parapsychology, there's two camps, the sheeps and the goats. The goats are those that don't believe. The sheep are those that tend to believe. For me, the ultimate channeling is to channel God, the universal creator, creation, being, mother, father, as Lazarus says, God, God is all that is. I think we're capable of connecting with all that is. As you incorporate more of the higher teachings into your understanding, then you're also able to teach others. So there must be spreading across the planet this consciousness of spirituality, of hope, and of creating miracles. Heaven is within us, and that we are, we are potentially all channels in that we are all able to connect to universal heart and mind and wisdom and energy and, and, um, and be representatives of our Creator. After dark, the streets of Chicago teem with a different kind of nightlife. If a shadowy image sends an icy chill down your spine, is it real or imagined? James Romanovich investigates unexplained phenomena of Chicago. Today we're going to take a look at a different side of Chicago, its sordid history, that which is filled with cemeteries, murders, and ghosts. People claim to see and feel ghosts. But ghost hunters are becoming much more scientific about the spirit world. And president of the Ghost Research Society, Dale Kaczmarek, shows us how. These devices will pick up that disturbance, and then we can try other equipment like our cameras and tape recorders and so forth. Basically what this does is it picks up static electricity discharges in a given location. Another DOS meter, which doesn't give an audible signal, but actually gives LED lights. Uh, we have a Geiger counter out here. One photo taken by Dale at Bachelors Grove Cemetery shows this translucent apparition of a woman sitting on a tombstone. We're here today to find out why so many people around the Chicagoland area travel to this particular cemetery in search of ghosts. If you look at the historical uh, significance of the area around here and the, the plots that they had, uh, their names are on all the plots. The Fultons, the Wheelers, they all came from the, the old country, from Germany. So I assume that many of these people that are buried in here knew one another, and perhaps they're still calling their friends even after death. There have been reports within the cemetery, uh, down this main trail, as you walk into the cemetery, of uh, what appears to be a woman, sometimes dressed in a white gown, or a wedding gown, or a bridal gown of some kind, holding a baby in her arms. So we know that through historical records, it belongs to D.W. Rogers. There was one recording which I had heard a number of years ago. Somebody had recorded uh, not too far, a few, uh, five or 10 feet away from this main gate here, uh, a t sound of, uh, of somebody calling Minna, Minna, uh, sort of wailing in the wind. And there is a graveside in here uh, with that name, that first name of Minna. The dead don't rest too easily out here at Bachelors Grove because of all the, uh, the sacrifice and the uh, things that have went on here in the past. It acts as like a battery, charging up this area to a point that eventually it discharges in a way through manifestations, through spirits, through cold spots, feelings, sightings, uh, and balls of light that people have seen. Bachelors Grove isn't the only haunted place in the city. Next, we went to Chicago's south side to hear the tale of a murder and a ghost. This is the roadway uh, located directly in front of the Willowbrook Ballroom, where 
In 1931, Resurrection Mary, or a girl named Mary, was later dubbed Resurrection Mary, was hitchhiking back home along this roadway when she was struck and killed by a hit-and-run automobile somewhere between the Willowbrook Ballroom and Resurrection Cemetery. And since 1931, she has been seen still trying to hitchhike back home from the Willowbrook to the cemetery and beyond, but she never gets beyond the cemetery. We're at uh, Resurrection Cemetery in South Suburban Justice, 7600 Archer Avenue. We're coming up to the main gates of the cemetery, where in August of 1976, a man traveling by the cemetery saw what appeared to be a girl locked in the cemetery after hours. When the police were dispatched to the area, they found these two bars of the cemetery gates pulled apart and bent at a very funny angle, and pressed in the bars with impressions of fingerprint, skin texture, and scorch marks. No one was able to give an explanation how those marks were made on the bars. Then we visited the Mount Carmel Cemetery to see the evidence of yet another haunting. We're coming up to a uh, very interesting grave here in uh, the cemetery. It's called Julia Bacola Petta. Julia died in 1921 at the age of 29 of uh, complications from childbirth. And she was buried here with her stillborn infant in this grave here at Mount Carmel Cemetery. Uh, soon after this, her mother, Philomena Bacola, began to have a series of unexplained dreams when Julia began pleading and begging with her mother to dig up and exhume the grave. This went on for many years as the frantic mother tried to get permission from the local parish, the cemetery, and other police authorities to exhume the grave. They found Julia uh, lying as fresh as the day she was buried, uh, apparently uh, no decomposition of the body whatsoever. Uh, there are two porcelain photographs on the, uh, um, the monument now. Uh, the top one shows Julia on her wedding day holding a bouquet of roses. The bottom picture on the base of the monument shows Julia as she was found six years later after being dug up in a perfect state of preservation. There isn't a reason why Julia had no signs of decomposition after six years. This day, a white ghostly figure is seen roaming near her grave. Now we go to a restaurant in downtown Chicago where the Ghost Research Society found unmistakable photographic evidence of ghosts. Uh, the first photograph shows absolutely nothing at all. Uh, the bottom photograph, taken a few seconds later after the film was uh, wound and recocked, shows some strange light formation to the left of the uh, the bust. What appears in this photograph, if you look to the extreme left near that table, it appears to be a, a semi-transparent figure of a monk-like individual, apparently cowled in a monk's habit. You can see the semi-transparent image above the table and directly below the table, underneath the tablecloth, you can see what appears to be semi-transparent feet and legs. This videotape was recorded by the Ghost Research Society at the stakeout of the restaurant. Listen closely. Personal accounts, recordings, and photographs. What do you think? Are the ghosts of Chicago real? or unreal. Terrifying tales of a brutal murderer and cannibal still haunt the small town of Rawlins, Wyoming. Can a prisoner's cruel past condemn him to his cell for all eternity? Our story starts here at the Wyoming Frontier Prison, formerly the state penitentiary. The prison closed in 1981, but some believe the spirits of a few inmates still remain behind the prison walls. Some of the worst murderers in the history of Wyoming spent their last days in the death house before their execution. This, this is the death house, and I think this place this place in history sounds a lot different than, feels a lot different than any place else in the prison. Uh, the one that really scares me is the guy on the back side. This cell belonged to 
I think, the worst murder in the history of Wyoming. When we do night tours, his candle always burns brighter or dimmer than any of the others. Um, I don't know, I feel a little uncomfortable talking about him. There's many times the hair on your back will stand up. You're fully aware that something is there, what you don't know. Pixley is tremendously scary. Uh, even when you're doing tours and you're talking about him, as a tour guide, you always get a sense that this is maybe something you shouldn't be talking about. You'll get the creeps and the willies, and the, the candles will flicker. His will, be, his will be straight. The other candles on the night tours will flicker. Definitely, a, There's definitely something to this story, I'm sure. The last execution, Andrew Pixley in 1965, um, he was the youngest guy executed here. He's 22 years old. And when he was executed, they wanted to make sure that there was no leaks in the gas chamber. Usually they go by a pig, but this time they went out onto the streets of Rollins and they found a stray black cat, and they executed it. Black cat supposedly haunts the penitentiary. I was running out of A block one night after I came out of the cell, and I was running around and this black cat darted out in front of me. And he went around the corner, and another tour guide, Molly, was waiting for me there, and it darted out in front of her, and it just disappeared. And um, every once in a while we see him, but he's lurking around every night to her. Uh, the one that scares me is the guy who was in the middle cell, Andrew Pixley. He was 21 years old when he committed the most horrible murder in the history of Wyoming. Um, family from Chicago on a ski vacation, Jackson Hall. Uh, he murdered two little girls. He, there was evidence of cannibalism. Uh, the beatings were so horrible. Uh, there are elements of Pixie's case that, in my opinion, are, are almost worse than Jeffrey Dahmer. He had the least witnesses. He had the most ministers. He was praying right at the time of his execution. He was baptized just for his execution. Andrew Pixley was described as the perfect psychopath. He had no conscience at all. He didn't remember any of the heinous crimes committed when they found him in the room covered with blood. His execution was carried out shortly after midnight, December the 10th, 1965, in the prison gas chamber. Andrew Pixley took longer to die than any other man in the death house. He lived twice as long as all the others in the gas chamber. He said it takes longer to kill evil, and I'm convinced this guy was pure evil. And I mean, I'm not a big proponent of capital punishment, but this Pixie character, he scares me to death because the crime was so horrible. Is the prison gas chamber. The mechanics of the gas chamber, the warden pulled a pin on the side, dropped this handle, a bag full of cyanide pellets rolled into acid below the chair. Prisoner was unconscious in 10 to 15 seconds. They were all dead within three minutes, except for Andrew Pixley. The witnesses were in the back room. For the first execution, there were 47 people in this room. By the time Andrew Pixley was executed in 1965, there were 13 people. They changed the seals around the windows before the execution. And then, as I said before, they test the gas chair to make sure it's working all right. We don't give tours in December. I'd been sitting in my office. I'd been researching the executions. We were doing a new display on the executions. I had a head full of stories of executions, but I didn't have all the dates. And I, I came up here, oh, it was getting kind of late, and I needed a flashlight to read the dates of the walls and the hanging room. I, uh, I was writing to the dates and with my flashlight in hand, and my flashlight drifted over and I caught the black eyes of Andrew Pixie. As I looked in the, deep into his eyes for the first time, I thought, there's something different about this guy. I'd never thought about it before. Uh, something evil, possessed, demonic. At the instant I thought that, I swear to you, I heard something. I, I didn't recognize it at first, but behind me, I heard the faint sound of crying, not, not just crying, young girls crying, and the sound of the crying was coming from the gas chamber. I was scared to death. Fumbling with my keys, I turned around, and I'm walking to get out of here as fast as I can. When I got outside, and I thought about this, I mean, why just at that moment did I hear the crying, and why did I hear it then? 
And then I heard the church bells ringing a few blocks over at the Catholic Church. And the first thing I thought was Andrew Pixie had renounced the Catholic faith shortly before his death. And then I realized it was December 10th, December 10th, 1965. His execution was just a few minutes after midnight that day. Andrew Pixley's sentence was death, but his soul is the grim reminder that not all is at peace. Ghosts have been defined as manifestations of persistent personal energy. They may haunt places they enjoyed while alive or the place where they met their death, especially if that death was violent. Let's take a look at an interesting case in Los Angeles. The Hollywood sign is one of the most readily identifiable landmarks in all of show business, but it's also the site of tragedy, mystery, and haunted intrigue. Peg Entwistle was a promising young actress in the 1930s who came to Hollywood, as did so many of her peers, with stars in her eyes. Her dazzling success as a teenager in Boston led her inevitably out west to the land that glitters. But despite bit parts in such films as 13 Weeks with Myrna Loy, Peg Entwistle's career never fully blossomed. On September the 18th, 1932, distraught, she climbed the steep slopes of Mount Lee to the great Hollywood Land sign, named after Max Sennett's ill-fated real estate venture. She found a ladder left by a workman and climbed to the top of the 50-foot high letter H. She must have stood there overlooking Hollywood and the studios for what seemed like eternity and then leapt to her death. There are those who claim her tormented soul still haunts the Hollywood Hills to this very day. Even in death, she couldn't find peace. I knew him as a young man, Nicky Hilton. I, had, I was with him on his honeymoon to Liz Taylor, and he was about the strangest, weirdest kid I'd ever met. The Jimmy Dean of millionaires, you know? The people tell us Hilton committed suicide here. And then I, I, I kind of peeked in that library when she mentioned it, and I walked down by myself, away from the crowd, the buffet, and the movie, whatever was going on, and I peeked in, and my God, there he was sitting at the desk. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, you know, made your hair stand on end. I, I kind of bolted out, you know. I can't explain why later on I thought I saw Groucho Marx there. Maybe it was my week for stars, I don't know. But uh, it, it, was, it was his vision or apparition, his look, you know, that, that look he had. He looked just like, like uh, Jimmy Dean. Sometime later, we had been invited over to the house and our hostess, taken me upstairs and shown me the bedroom. The carpeting was stained with blood. It was the same room where Nicky Hilton years before had slashed his wrists. And the strange thing was, no matter how many times the carpeting had been replaced, the blood stains kept coming back. While we were examining the carpet, our hostess's daughter called to the room on the intercom. Something really strange was happening in the kitchen. Well, we rushed down there wondering what could be causing such a fright something was definitely shaking the liquor cabinet. I mean, from the inside, we, we, we thought maybe a cat had gotten in there, but after our hostess unlocked it, all the shaking stopped and there was nothing unusual at all about it. She then closed the bar and locked it and everything went crazy. Liquid came pouring out, bottles were shaking. I was scared to death. He and I looked at each other. We were both panic stricken. Oh, it's frightening, especially the no noise and rattling and shaking bottles, you know, actually hearing something. And you think maybe it's a tremor, an earthquake, or what, or some, some kind of a gag. Or, you know, like right on cue, everything, things would happen constantly in that house.
According to Christian teachings, Mary was blessed among women for giving birth to the one that would take away the sins of the world and bring peace to all. Well, a woman in Southern California claims to see visions of the Virgin Mary and passes along her message of love and guidance. Jim Romanovich investigates. Just north of California's city, thousands flock to a small valley in the Mojave Desert to catch a vision of the Virgin Mary. Faithfully, believers and non-believers come the 13th of every month for spiritual transformation and healing from prayers and blessings of the Mother of Jesus herself. We came here in August. This is our fifth time being here today. Um, in August, we came and I didn't see anything, but my children had saw the Virgin Mary and they cried. And then um, we came back again in September and we saw the Virgin Mary and I saw her myself. I saw her today. She was real small. She was, was looking at everybody from the, seal, from the sky. While some of the faithful can see the apparition, the image and messages from the Blessed Mother, known as Our Lady of the Rock, are given to Maria Paula, a pious Catholic from Mexico who first saw the vision in 1989. Her meeting with the Holy Mother was foreseen by her three-year-old daughter, who at the time was intensive care with leukemia. She told her mother to look for a sign in the mountains. I started climbing the mountain and saw a rock. I was going to step on the rock. I wasn't wearing shoes since I wanted to climb quickly. But this rock wasn't a rock. It was a snake. I heard a very nice sound like a fine fabric. Birds were singing. And when I was going to turn around, I heard her voice say, no, don't look back. Only look at me, and you're going to be safe. I am the Lady of the Rock, the Queen of Peace of Southern California. She came on a cloud when I saw her. When I looked over there, the sun was so beautiful. Behind her, a bright ray of light. I could see her face so clearly, her eyes, brown hair, and rosy cheeks. Her nose and mouth were the most perfect things you could see. At the apparition site, people line up according to their illness, physical, spiritual, and even terminal. Some of those who come to see Maria Paula and hear the messages from the Virgin Mary have claimed a miraculous healing. Maria de Mesa, a registered nurse, says her lupus was cured. Maria Paula prayed over me. And then after that, I told Maria Paula, oh, you know, because I have lupus, you know. And then she told me, no, no lupus, no lupus. I said, Mama Paula, I have lupus. And she keeps on insisting that I don't have the lupus. Another woman, Frances Pondo, has experienced miraculous healing. After I got out of the hospital and I was able, a little strong enough to come, I came. And they brought me by wheelchair and I came three times. And after that, I've been coming. Did a physical change come over her while she was in the presence of Maria Paula? The first time when the wheelchair, no. The second time, I was able to stand. And then um, Maria Paula, she prayed on me. She um, touched me, and I felt heat. And then um, after that, I started getting better slowly. People who claim to see visions of the Virgin Mary or other saintly apparitions are put through rigorous testing to determine their authenticity. Father Juan Santillan of Our Lady Help of Christians Church describes the church's position on these cases. Normally, when it's brought to the particular priest, the individual priest, he will have to see, first of all, that that person, how's their family life? Psychologically, their stability, their emotional life. Then what are the things that begin to occur that might give indication that there's a possibility of it being on the part of the divine. And normally you'll find that sometimes humans, there's a tremendous need for attention. There's a tremendous need of being someone and to be in the limelight. There is so much mm, confusion. There is so much neglect. There is so much abandonment. There is so much maltreatment of humans against humans that humans need some of that little supernatural, maybe to make them come back to their senses. According to belief, the apparition is seen by the devout, 
or those the Virgin Mary chooses, the Blessed Mother also allows herself to be photographed as a gift. But then when you have be a Polaroid and other regular cameras and different Polaroids, and they're all focusing you on the same section, and each one has a different picture of that reality, then you can't help but think, well, something might be happening here. The strength of personal faith and Maria Paula's healing abilities are tested almost every day. Edward Martinez came from Arizona to confide in Father Juan's terminal diagnosis of cancer. Eight weeks ago, I guess it was, I was diagnosed as having a very rare cancer. It's called thymoma. It's a fast-spreading uh, cancer. And they had told me that uh, if I didn't go to the chemotherapy and the um, um, radiation that uh, I'd probably had about six months or less. I had uh, just about almost given up. I mean, and I'm not a give, uh, I'm not the kind of guy that gives up, but when they told me up there that that's all the time I had left, it's, it's kind of hard to take. Whether he will be healed remains to be seen. Feel the heat in your veins. Watch it come up. This is coming up. It's coming up. Yes. The heat is coming up. Yes. You're right. Yeah. Visions of the Virgin Mary have been occurring for centuries. Only in this century have they become documented and officially approved by the Church. Though Our Lady of the Rock is not yet recognized by the Church, the surprising aspect of this supernatural experience is that the message is almost always the same. It's up to us to decide if we want to listen to it or not. Repent, my children, because time is short. Our Blessed Mother says we should be careful with our actions, for this will bring you to salvation or the loss of your soul. Let's go with caution, my brothers. Clean up the confusion of our human hearts. A vision of the Virgin Mary comes to Maria Paula once to three times a day. When I interviewed her, she claimed the image appeared twice and a statue of the Virgin wept. I have to, at this point, play the devil's advocate. I can't say whether I believe it or not believe it. There's many things that I'm beginning to accept. On a truthful basis, I don't need visions. I don't need to see uh, angels. I don't need to see uh, the Blessed Mother. I don't need to see our Lord. My faith is already set, and that's all I need. Hauntings and apparitions are reported throughout the world and seem to be connected to people with high emotional energy. One of the hot spots for emotional energies would have to be Hollywood. Just ask anyone in the entertainment business. Let's see what we can find here. The Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel used to be the gathering place for stars during Hollywood's golden era. The hotel is rich with the spirit of Hollywood. But do Hollywood spirits still visit? During the making of the movie From Here to Eternity, Montgomery Clift lived on the ninth floor of the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. He stayed for over three months. After shooting each day, he would return to the hotel and spend hours rehearsing his lines and playing the bugle, which he had to learn for the movie. Since his death, guests and employees of the hotel have reported many times that late at night, they hear the sound of a bugle playing in the hallway near room 928, Montgomery Clift's room. Terrell Velaza was hired as a cocktail waitress, but also helped with the renovation of the hotel before its grand reopening in 1986. First week here, it was good. The end of the, the beginning of the second week is when I was getting off the ninth floor elevator and I was walking down the hall and I heard footsteps behind me. I turned around to see if there was anybody following me and there was nobody there. And then as I was continuing to walk, I felt a cold, a cold 
breeze like walk right by me. And I went down in the elevator and never went back up. What was it that brushed past Terrell Velasa in the hallway? Could it still be Montgomery Clift playing his bugle after all these years? Ghost experts believe sightings such as these are examples of spirits returning to places where they enjoyed happy times in life. Actor Clifton Webb, who was nominated for three Academy Awards, lived here with his mother, Mabel. He was very superstitious, and when she died, he locked all her clothes away and never entered the room. He believed her ghost still lived there. Clifton is no longer with us either. Or is he? New tenants claim chairs move by themselves, cigarettes break, and their cats disappear. Oh, by the way, Clifton Webb hated cats and cigarettes. This is Runyon Canyon, an overgrown wilderness located in the heart of Hollywood. In 1983, the city of Los Angeles purchased the canyon and established a park on the site of a former estate known as the Pines. The magnificent estate in Running Canyon was first built by singing star John McCormick in the 30s and later bought by AMP heir Huntington Hartford. But the place was abandoned in the 60s and the lavishly landscaped grounds left for ruin. What was once the site of wild Hollywood parties, frequented by such stars as Errol Flynn, eventually crumbled and decayed. All that's left now is a virtual ghost estate. Residents say they hear sounds of a party and have seen strange multicolored lights coming from the second story of where the main house once stood. But the bizarre sightings go even further. Neighborhood resident Tracy Vivot is a waitress during the day and one of several who have witnessed unusual phenomena. I just lived down the street from the park, so I used to come up here jogging after work. And um, one day I came after work. It was a little later than I usually come. So I started jogging up the hill, and all of a sudden I felt this cool, cold air brush past me. It was a little unnerving and especially, I mean, it was the middle of the summertime, it was July. So I turned around and I jogged back down the hill and um, I started just doing some easy stretching and I was bending over and I caught something on the corner of my eye and, um, and it turned. And I saw this, this figure, this man, and he was on this bottom of these stairs. And he looked at me, and he froze. And he turned around, and he walked up the stairs, and he just walked right off into nowhere. I mean, after he vanished, and after he left, I, I went over to the stairs, and the stairs just end. So if it was like a real person, they would have had to jump down or something, but this ghost, or I don't know what it was, it just sort of went right out into nowhere. I left and this is, I don't come here anymore. <laughs> The brilliance of a Hollywood star never fades with age. In the movie business, some spirits of deceased celebrities are still searching for the bright lights. From Hollywood studios to stars' homes, even the dead cannot resist being in the limelight. From the outside, these studios look like just another industrial warehouse. But there's more going on here than just movie making. On a prison set, unusual sounds, strange movements, and unexplained happenings have become almost commonplace. I can't really, you know, count the number of times that something strange has happened down here. I can just tell you that the employees do not like to be down here at night alone. Well, we had an operational manager who, uh, I don't know, he got in a fight with his wife or whatever the reason was, but he decided to stay in the corporate offices overnight. He heard some noise and he kind of woke up and 
and looked, and there was a lady in a green dress. I don't know, he said she looked 25, 30 years old, run through the offices. And he looked through the blinds into the corporate, off, into the corporate uh, meeting room, and uh, he went in, and there was nothing. And he was, pretty, he was pretty shook up the next day. He didn't want anybody else to know about it when he came and talked to me. He was afraid what people might think of him because it sounded so, you know, so strange. Tom Mix, the famous cowboy star of the silent movies, does not rest in peace. Since his death in 1940, two families have occupied his house. The second family left over three years ago. Since then, it's remained vacant. Both families claim the house is haunted. Tom Mix was killed in an automobile accident in his 60th year. When he slammed on his brakes, his luggage, which was stowed in the back seat of the car, smashed into his head and broke his neck. He was buried in his White Ranger suit, his white riding breeches, his handmade boots, and a diamond belt buckle that spelled out his name. The last family that lived here have told how one night, as they were getting ready to take a trip up north for the weekend, they experienced a very strange phenomenon. Dan, the husband, carried his and his wife's luggage from their bedroom down the steps to the front door. It was raining outside, so he left his suitcases and went to open the trunk of the car. On opening it, he saw that it was filled with gifts and that there was no room for their luggage. So he closed the lid, opened the back door, preparing to stow the suitcases in the rear seat. He then ran back inside, only to discover the luggage was gone. He called to his wife, Tracy, to ask if she had taken them. No, she hadn't. Together, they looked all through the house, but couldn't find their luggage anywhere. Then, Tracy heard a sound from downstairs. It sounded like a door closing, so they went to investigate. The downstairs bedroom used to be a master suite connecting to the bathroom and dressing area. It was Tom Mix's bedroom. Dan and Tracy didn't use it as their bedroom because it always felt cold and damp. When they entered the room, Dan noticed that the closet door was ajar. And when Tracy opened it, there was their luggage neatly aligned. They never did find out how that luggage got there. But they learned that the night Tom Mix died, it was raining and he was heading north for the weekend. Internationally known artist Charles Bragg lives in a home with a uniquely star-studded legacy. This is an old house, and uh, it was originally built by uh, William Randolph Hearst for uh, Marion Davies' favorite director, Robert Vignola. And uh, from what we understand, uh, he would rehearse her up here. There's a little theater downstairs with a proscenium and uh, curtains, and it's like a tiny theater. And she would come up here and rehearse with the, uh, Vignola. And then twice a week, William Randolph Hearst would come up here and she would put on little shows for him. I'd like to say I don't believe in ghosts. I'd like to, but I really can't. It seems to me that for so many years and so many uh, experiences by so many different people uh, that it's not beyond the realm of possibility that there is something going on in this world and in the Hollywood Hills in particular. Well, this is my studio and uh, it's a very important room to me and uh, I've worked here for a couple of months before I realized that uh, this is also where Marion Davies put on her little shows for William Randolph Hearst and I thought it'd be a good idea to just hang curtains on it, you know, just to add a little atmosphere to an artist's studio. And it seems that that's when uh, things started to happen in this, on this platform, uh, after the curtains went up. Suddenly our dogs started to respond. Right around 8.15 in the evening, uh, they would be sound asleep, just relaxed by the fireplace. And uh, all of a sudden they would jump up, get very alert, and then both of them simultaneously make their way down this little passageway, sort of almost a secret little passageway down. And I just find them down there just sitting in the dark, looking straight towards the stage. After uh, watching the dogs uh, behave 
the way they were, uh, I didn't think too much of it. But naturally, uh, the second or third time, uh, I started thinking about it. So in the next morning, I would come down and check to see if everything's in the right place, things are in order. And uh, it's the strangest thing, the curtains were down as if they'd almost been drawn at the end of a performance. They weren't completely together, but it was almost as if the performance were over for that, uh, for that time. And so I put them back up and tried to paint and forget about it, but I can't. While some spirits are at peace, others return to haunt their previous dwellings. Hauntings can be innocent and brief, but there are those which include ongoing apparitions, noises, and moving objects. Hollywood has given us our fair share of demons, exorcisms, and hauntings. In real life, however, there are stories that make these movies seem pale in comparison. Harry Shepard is a de-haunter, as he likes to call it, a spirit investigator. His everyday life deals with ghosts and spirits. Well, since I was five years old, I've been able to see them. I thought everybody saw spirit and auras until later in life. I was told, Harry, what you and I see, not everybody sees. To me, it, it's a natural thing. It's natural. An inborn instinct to fear anything we cannot explain has made us suspicious of any strange phenomena, especially ghosts. To accept the unknown, to accept something that you can't see, is quite difficult in this culture. All of our culture and all of our social life, we're taught if we can't eat it, kill it, or destroy it, it isn't so. Harry is of the opinion that ghosts are merely spirits that have not accepted the fact that they had to leave the earthly plane. He also believes ghosts roam most houses or buildings. We just don't know about them because they are quiet. Only when they become active do people sense this, like doors banging, TVs clanking on and off, changing channels. Uh, then they think, oh my God, it's going to come out of the wall and get me. There is reassurance in the fact that most spirits are harmless and have no intention to make life difficult for people. In fact, they are often around us for our own well-being. Well, the spirit is perfectly content on the other side, but he feels he has to stay to nurture and to comfort the one on the living side. When sudden inexplicable things occur in houses, Harry and a team of experts are normally called to investigate. The investigation is a team effort. We usually use a team of people of between four and eight, and each one of these has a different specialty. Some can see, some can hear some consents. Everybody in the team is essential to gather any information on the strange phenomena. Some people can sense the presence of spirit, but not see it. Some people can see it and not sense it. I can walk into a residence and see if there is anybody there or if there isn't anybody there. They can appear any way that they want to. They can appear as the last they did in their physical life, or they can appear as a cloud. It's up to the spirit, individual. It is more than curiosity that moves people to call Harry to investigate any spirit presence in their house. We tell them what they, who is there, and why they're there. Most of the time, they are there, but they behave themselves, the spirits, that is. Even with the knowledge that spirits are around us and present in our houses, it is only when these spirits become troublesome that a de-haunting becomes necessary. The process to remove these spirits is far easier than we believe. Well, we ask it to leave. Simple as that. Would you mind leaving? We, uh, there, there is no ceremony, there is no ritual that we go through. We simply ask it to leave. And why would the spirit stay where he wasn't wanted anyhow? One of the most notorious cases of spirit investigation is the John John case in Los Angeles. Strange things occurred in and around the house. The only thing left to do was to call a team of spirit investigators. Something completely unexpected happened. It started out where they were taking Polaroid pictures, and by accident, one of them asked a question. And when the Polaroid picture was developed, 
There was an answer there. The phenomena of ghosts leave us with little proof, and sometimes just the idea that it was all a hallucination. The only physical proof is what they give us, like the pictures with the writing on them. What's the chance that you would get that exact answer with that exact picture at that exact time? Impossible. Over the years, Harry has built up a collection of voice recordings, those of spirits. At the time of the recording, the investigators wouldn't hear the voices. But when the tape is played back on the recorder, the ghost's voices are distinct and definite in their answers. There was a child's grave. And sitting on top of this grave was the spirit form of a, of a child. When we, when we put, the, put the tape decks down to him, and he, he pulled it almost out of our hand, and we get this little whisper, I'm scared. The critics have found every possible excuse to disprove the existence of spirits. They can always find skeptics to, to criticize everything in life, even death. You would think that Harry's job is horrifying, but in fact he enjoys it. He sees it as his mission in life to prove to people that there is nothing to be frightened about. We do this work for nothing as a public service. The more proof we can gather, the better we feel we can, we can serve the public. We do leave them with an idea that, hey, maybe there is something more to life than life. Harry views the spirit world as a natural part of our lives. He believes that it is the physical part of existence that is merely temporary. We have all lived many lives, and we'll all live many more. And the reason that we're here is to learn certain lessons, certain goals that we cannot learn on a non-physical reality, such as the spirit dimension. Ghosts and apparitions have given rise to legends and have created their own place in history. Maybe we can learn to accept ghosts as part of our everyday lives. After all, if we think about it, what are ghosts but the mere shadows of their former selves? Superstition can make us do crazy things. One wealthy widow created a magnificent estate and kept workers busy on it 24 hours a day for years for the sole purpose of confusing evil spirits. People consult mediums for a lot of reasons, to get advice on their life or to look into the future. But for Sarah L. Winchester, one medium's advice kept her busy for 38 years. Did the staircases leading to nowhere and the windows in the floor help her attain eternal life? Sarah Winchester, heir to the Winchester rifle fortune, came to Northern California in 1884. Until the night she died, she spent her entire life creating a house that to this day remains a mystery. Well, she's somewhat of a mystery, um, as I'm sure she wanted to be. Uh, she was very reclusive, didn't know many people in the area, and kept to herself pretty much. We don't really know who she was. Whoever Mrs. Winchester was, she was certainly enigmatic. The house she created, every hallway, every window, makes you continually wonder, why? This is called the Goofy Staircase, and I think you can see why. Oh, I sure can. This is crazy. <laughs> and was she a little woman? Yes, she was only four feet ten, so she could have made it through this a little easier than we are. I'm sure construction workers wondered why they were told to build this house, but she paid generously, and they did what she asked. She began building in 1884, and she started out with an eight-room farmhouse, and it mushroomed into, into what we have today. Where does this door go? Go ahead and find out. Whoa. Does it go anywhere? No. <laughs> Was this here originally? Yes, yeah. She put these things in to try and confuse the spirits. She was married to William Wirt Winchester, and he was the second president of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. She inherited all of his money after his death, and when she came out here, she became very uh, fascinated with the occult. So where are we going now? Down 13 steps. She was really fascinated with the number 13. Yeah. Uh, this room we're going into actually has 13 windows. The 13 windows. There's 10 on this wall. 
two there, and then the 13th uh, overlooks the room where she died, actually. The number 13 had an irresistible appeal to Mrs. Winchester. It's found all over the house. 13 wall panels in the ballroom, 13 lights in the chandeliers, and 13 holes in a drain. Even some plants grow mysteriously into the number 13. Well, she had her own seance room, and she conducted nightly seances to communicate with the spirits of, of those who were killed by the Winchester rifle. She really believed that the spirits killed her husband and daughter, and fearing them, she had to build and build as they told her, and that way she could achieve eternal life. And this is the room where she died. Uh, she died in 1922. Psychics have conducted seances in this room, and two figures have been seen, neither of which were Mrs. Winchester. But visitors to the house have heard the ghostly chords of an organ echoing down the hallways. The house itself is a treasure trove of mysteries, from the baffling message in a window, to the stairway leading nowhere, window in the floor, cupboard that opens up to a wall, and closet as big as an apartment. There's no telling how much more Sarah Winchester might have built if she had not died in 1922. But who's to say she's finished? Maybe her spirit still roams these maze-like hallways, looking for a way back in. In every country of the world, in every language, local legends of murder and mystery abound. Those who tell the stories do so in hushed tones, so as not to anger the restless spirits as they roam the night. The town of El Fuerte in Sinaloa, Mexico, was a quiet place back in the 1800s. It looked like many other colonial towns in the area with its lovely plaza in the center of town. The one thing that set El Fuerte apart was the Orantia Mansion, conspicuously located at the edge of the plaza. It was a huge structure, occupying nearly a full city block. It was lavishly decorated with furnishings from around the world, a chandelier from Italy, furniture from Vienna. It was built to the discerning taste of the wealthiest man in the state. Francisco Camillo Orantia. In 1869, he died, leaving the house and his fortune to his only heir, 18-year-old Adelaida. With all this wealth, you would think the beautiful young woman would have a perfect life. But instead, it seemed that Adelaida was too preoccupied with protecting her fortune for anything else. She became eccentric, withdrawn, antisocial, and so she ended up a lonely spinster in the huge house, rarely venturing outside as the years went by. Then, on September the 26th, 1927, the life of Adelaida took a violent turn. As she slept in her bed, she was brutally murdered. The fortune which had brought her all the luxuries of life was the cause of her death. Her trusted maid, Elisa, confessed to killing Adelaida for her money. It seemed to the people of El Fuerte that this would be the tragic end to the story of Adelaida Orantia. Little did they know that rather than an end, this would actually mark the beginning of a bizarre new chapter. People began hearing unusual sounds and seeing strange visions in the vacant Orantia mansion. Uh, in the town of El Fuerte, many people have been uh, talking about uh, this old house uh, and uh, about the ghost in the house. Many people have seen a, a woman in the balcony or in some of the rooms and the letters, the, but there are some ghosts in the house. The visions that are reported in the Orantia mansion are always described as a young woman in a white dress one that could be a wedding dress. 
She has been spotted in many parts of the huge house. Often she is seen carrying a candelabra of lighted white candles. One night, a local photographer was able to snap an amazing photo in the house. He described seeing a woman in a white dress walk by carrying a candelabra. In the photo, you can plainly see the trail of the candles, and in the center is the faint outline of a woman. Several other people have had first-hand experiences with the Orenteer ghost. En una ocasión venía yo caminando por la calle que está frente al alto de los Orantia. One time I was walking along the street down by the Orantia house. All of a sudden I glanced over and I saw a woman on the balcony. I recognized her. It was Adelaria Orantia. Yo sabía que esa era la única casa donde vivía. I knew it was her. I knew her personally all my life. There she stood, looking exactly as she did as a young girl, in a long, flowing white gown. Pues yo sabía perfectamente bien que ella ya había muerto. But I knew perfectly well that she was dead. I'd been at her funeral 65 years ago. And now I was seeing her exactly as she looked when she was a young woman. I got very scared. I looked again, and to my disbelief, this time, she went down and disappeared until I was staring at an empty balcony. Then I became terribly frightened and I ran home. I was so nervous, I had to run. Another El Fuerte man still vividly remembers his encounter with the Orenteer ghost 30 years ago. When I, when I was a, a young man, I used to work in this house, sweeping the floor and, and taking care of some rooms in this house because it's a large and big house. And when I was doing my work, uh, I heard a noise behind me when I saw uh, to see what was what, what happening. Then I saw suddenly a, a, a woman in uh, with a white dress, walking from room to another room, and 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 she disappeared into the wall, and I I was very afraid, and I I go very nervous outside of the house, running away because I I really uh, was very afraid, and then now the house is empty because the people doesn't want to go to go and rent or whatever. It is very very strange. Well, I can tell you, that is definitely one lovely old house I will not be spending the night in.